I live in Pennsylvania near the lake's beaches. I am drawn to our planet's water and sun and moon and all of the nature and its colors, subtle to splendid. Each of us, more than any singular thing, we are a species of many and bonded in one planetary zip code by the fresh air and pure fresh water our planetary home provides us. And we are all connected by this space in time. We are all in danger of an existence as we have known it. Background extinction is a term. It is also a reality. At an alarming rate, we are losing our amphibians, birds, and species that are critical in connecting us. The existence of our lives can reach a tipping point and no return. And there is only one solution. We are the solution. We are the plan. Our forests are on fire. Rain and windstorms and extreme weather events are destroying entire towns, building and growing in ferocity and damage. Climate is a human cost and an economic cost to all countries now. Climate is the largest factor in migration. They are migrating to where they can inhabit. All belongings are lost. Lives are lost. What happens when we lose too many forests? What happens when too much of our glaciers melt too fast? What happens when the temperatures get too hot for humans? Can we begin to reverse the damage this human species has made in a short 200 years since the Industrial Revolution and the fossil fuel addiction that fractures deep into our planetary home, destroying our fresh air and our fresh water? What do we do? We begin with a plan. We are the plan. You are part of the Green Connection. Our land and our forests are half of the critical link that connects humans and all species life through vital natural ecosystem functions. Our trees, we have learned from Peter Wallabin, are like human families with tree parents that live together with their children. They communicate with them, support them as they grow, and share nutrients with those that are sick or struggling, and even warn each other of impending dangers. And with over half of our forested land owned by families and organizations, its care is critical in changing climate conditions. And only 31% of all Earth is forested. That percentage plays a vital role purifying our air and water from pollutants for all species on this planet. And most people are not aware that one of our most valuable forest resources is our parks that reduce harmful carbon pollution that drives climate change. From the redwood majestic giants protected by our national forests to our local parks that create abundant species habitat, who benefit and depend on our forest silviculture, all of it, our very healthy species play space. It is space where our families and children connect with nature, where they play, where we enjoy our walking and bike trails, and events that socially connect us. But, in some communities, our green infrastructure suffers worse practices, and our children are pointing to and depending on us.
And this happens when there are worse practices. This whole place is sand. This is an ancient sand dune. This is a la ancient Lake Erie sand dune. And they just like bulldozed all the way through it. And the silver culture is pretty wrecked. Oh, this, this is a watershed. How did this happen in a protected watershed? We're going to be down there. First heavy rain you have, it's all over town there in that run. Yeah. Those are the roots holding this whole bank together. How many centuries of that tree? Ancient trees are critical to carbon sequestration and they are removed for cash. You gotta, you gotta stop and think about the root structure here. Those roots. Yep. Now they're. Would have gone out as far as the bank. You know, all I heard was cracking and chainsaws, cracking and busting, snapping. Yeah. To the point where I actually said, how much cutting are you doing? I mean, uh, at least if we get back here. Love of the animals. And you Over the years, when we first came here, I complained about the animals eating my plants and shrubs. Um, so you learn to live with the animals. You learn what plants and shrubs to plant. You learn to get along with them. They sleep out in my backyard in the open in wintertime. I'm so used to having the, uh, the deer. And I'm so used to seeing the fox at different times of the year and their kids. It's, that devastated me when I saw that the whole, the whole den was gone. It was just blown through. I don't have the owls, and you walk through the woods now, and the, the birds are upset. It's going to take a while. Not much thought went into this. I, I don't call this this logging. I call this raping the land and the lot the loss of the ecosystem. You know, with the uh, the animals and so forth. It's 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 really sad. They're, and I don't know if they, why, why they picked this way, because it, it doesn't affect like a hundred people. It's just a few families. The word is as important as a hundred people. I saw the healthy trees that are just hanging now and leaning. Yeah. This worst practice logging took ancient trees critical to climate protection. And worst practice logging poses a major threat to the people and wildlife that call forest home. But we can turn to a best practices plan. I think... When people ask how we're managing forests for resilience, that's that's the word right there is it's diversity, right? Because the future is unknown. We don't know what impacts we're gonna have with climate change. We don't even know what tree species will be able to grow here in 50 or 100 years. So the best thing that we can do is have a diverse forest that maximizes the opportunities and the options. So whatever impact comes down, whether it's increased temperatures, increased wind events, it's a new forest past some insect or an invasive plant. If we have a diverse forest, it's just more likely to be able to take that hit and bounce back, right? So that's the thought process behind. I know that's a big, broad thought process, but. So what's important to, to know is that with all those criteria, all those issues, we can find a strike against any tree, right? So we can walk up to the nicest tree in this forest, a large tulip poplar behind us, and we can say, ah, oh, I see a couple dead branches up there. I see some knots up top, which are some defect in the wood. If we're looking for an excuse to cut trees because we want to make money, we can find a reason to cut any tree in the forest. But that's not good forestry. Instead, we want to say, well, step back and say, if I cut that tree, what is the likely impact to the forest? That is the number one thing that drives our thought process. By cutting this tree, how will I influence the forest? Is it a positive influence or most likely a negative? Horse logging, worst first indicators, are forestry best practices. It ensures the forest's long-term health and growth. It allows younger saplings and vegetation to regenerate. And that is the insurance for a resilient climate future. As we travel from the rural to the urban, 
we are aware that our parks and streets are a cooling oasis in our escalating climate heat islands. Their cooling benefits reach beyond their park areas. We will meet with Sarah Charlotte Powers in Central Park. Sarah is an innovator in urban forest education and collaboration. My name is Sarah Charlotte Powers. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Natural Areas Conservancy, which is a nonprofit organization based in New York City. One of the things that was really important for us as we were putting together our plan for New York City was the realization that there wasn't a lot of information about how cities across the United States are approaching this topic. And so in 2018, we conducted a national survey. We heard from 125 organizations, and this year we'll actually be convening teams from 12 of those cities. And we found that in some ways, folks are working on a lot of the same issues. People are tackling the challenges of invasive plants. They're thinking about how to balance human use and visitation with sensitive ecological areas. Um, but we also found that there's some emerging new themes that are really, they're kind of stumpers. We're all together trying to figure out how to approach them. And those include the challenges of climate change and how we manage our forests to advance climate protection. So two unique themes that came out of the survey findings um, that I'd like to mention. One is the role of climate change in our urban areas and how forests can be managed to help cities to adapt to climate, to help us cool our cities, to help provide refuge in really hot times from extreme heat and also how we manage the forest to adapt to climate change itself. So how we make sure that our forests exist 100 or 200 years from now and how the things that we're planting today and the investments we're making are setting us up for long-term success. I mentioned New York City has about 10,000 acres of forest in the area. And I wanted to also mention that when we looked across the country at the work of this coalition of 125 organizations, that they're managing 1.7 million acres of forest within cities. So when I think about the work we're doing locally, our 10,000 acres includes over 5 million trees. And when you think about scaling that to almost 2 million acres and think about you know, how many trees that is and how many people's lives that touches, I just think it, it gives you this totally different perspective about the importance of urban forests, the need to think about how we manage them differently than maybe we have in the past. And it's, um, I think before we looked at those numbers, we had a hard time imagining the ways in which the work and innovation of individual cities and organizations could really have a national or even global impact. But thinking about just the sheer volume and land area that's bigger than the state of Delaware, or bigger than the Grand Canyon, and it's located where the majority of Americans live. So that's a, that's a big deal and that's a big potential impact. And it's one of the things that I'm really interested to explore more and to create more opportunities for cities to share with each other. So I feel like we have a lot we could be learning from one another. As we leave the busy streets of New York City, we continue on an awareness path that our streets, all streets, on all continents, are contributors to the heat index that rises when there is no green infrastructure to cool them. When there are no street trees to remove the fossil fuel greenhouse gas toxins, to reduce heat, and to mitigate stormwater on flooding streets. The answer to this solution is education to the people who are the governance and the stewards of our towns. That these stewards enact the legislation for street and parking lot green infrastructure. Because you see, on a 90 degree day, we experience 120 degree temperatures. With street tree infrastructure, a 90 degree day becomes 70 degrees. A big difference. And scientific evidence for warming of the climate system is unequivocal. So our actions are critical. Our children's future depends on these actions for a resilient and sustainable future. 
we can turn to the practices of Tom Hilton, Pulitzer Prize winning author of Save Our Land, Save Our Towns, and his hierarchy of ordinances for building green infrastructure cities. As citizens growing in awareness, we can take charge of our climate destiny with a Plant It Forward Tree Planting Initiative. If a city of 50,000 people each planted five trees in front of their homes, that would be a quarter of a million trees in just one year and a substantial beginning of tree corridors and bumping up your green infrastructure, purifying and cooling your air, sequestering CO2 toxins, and increasing stormwater sequestration. That seems a small task, but it is significant to change for our children's future. Our children's future also depends on our collective efforts and proactions to protect the water that surrounds us, that also provides our food and 60% of our oxygen. We journey to visit NASA, the leaders of education on our ocean planet. The oceans are massive. They cover almost three quarters of the Earth's surface and they are really critical to the health of the planet. I'm Dr. Kevin Tyson. I teach courses in geology, oceanography, and climate change. There are many reasons why the oceans are critical to the health of our planet. First, the oceans play a large role in regulating climate. For example, currents in the ocean carry heat from the tropics towards the poles into the regions of the planet that would otherwise be much colder. And of course, the fisheries in the ocean are absolutely critical as a primary source of food for many people around the world. The two biggest ways humans are impacting the ocean right now are by increasing water temperature and increasing the ocean's acidity. Human activity has increased the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Because the air is warmer, the ocean is absorbing some of that heat. And carbon dioxide is acidic, so when the oceans absorb carbon dioxide, the ocean water gets more acidic. It's the acidification of the ocean that is especially freaking me out. If we look back just 100 years ago, the level of acid in the ocean was relatively low, blue in this animation. But since then, the oceans have gotten more acidic. That's the green color. As we look into the future, the oceans will get even more corrosive. Many tiny organisms in the ocean use calcium carbonate to build their skeletons and shells, but higher acid levels interfere with that process and could lead to extinctions, and that's scary. We're talking about corals and other animals and plants that are at the base of the food chain. Oceans and all large bodies of water absorb carbon dioxide. That's part of my research right now. I'm studying shallow lakes because they seem to be very efficient at pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it away for long periods of time. My research is a small piece in a much larger effort by thousands of scientists in how to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And what really gives me hope is that as more people learn about what's going on, the more they seem willing to take action to protect the oceans and our planet. Hello, my name is Brendan Ballanger. I'm both an artist and a biologist. And for the past uh, over two decades, I've been creating art that's inspired from my scientific field research and ecological field research, uh, mostly focusing on the loss of biodiversity and kind of the, the changes that we are making to ecosystems, we as a species, and the way those are impacting other species. And really the, the overarching goal of both my art and science are to learn a little bit more about what's happening at this moment in history 
and hopefully inspire people to try to take steps towards conservation and thinking through like how every one of our actions or inactions have an impact and how some of our actions can be very positive and actually support life around us and biodiversity all over the world. So I've been studying biology and uh, terrestrial ecosystems, uh, specifically amphibians, for almost two decades. A uh, big focus of my primary research, my, um, the work that I was doing for many years, was focused on amphibians, specifically frogs and toads and what are called anurans. Those are tailless amphibians and the way that they develop in really complex ecosystems. So I was really interested to see how alterations to things like the food chain in freshwater wetlands could impact their development, or actually in some cases cause uh, severe deformities. Um, in a very complicated way, um, what we found is that uh, certain types of parasites and predators can cause supernumeric limb growth or missing limbs in frogs and toads as they start to develop. But that's just a part of the puzzle. Um, it turns out that at least in the agricultural wetlands we were looking at, that in the presence of agrochemicals and agricultural practices, such as runoff or eutrophication, where too many nutrients are going into a wetland, it creates a kind of food chain that's often out of balance within those ponds. And as such, you actually get more parasites and certain kinds of predators which can um, then attack tadpoles um, causing these kind of limb abnormalities. But there's still many un unanswered questions uh, when it comes to amphibian deformities. But specifically I was interested in that because all over the world amphibians have been disappearing. So in my lifetime um, we've lost probably about over 40 percent of them. And so trying to figure out ways that what's causing things like deformities or these declines uh, are really important so that we can learn how to protect them and, and make sure that they continue to flourish. Um, so that deals a little bit with both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Um, in 2015, my family and I moved from New York City to South Louisiana. And since I moved down to South Louisiana, I'm no longer working as a frog guy, but instead as a fish guy. So um, working in the fish lab at Louisiana State University as a postdoctoral researcher. And my work is really focused on trying to gather information about endemic fishes in the Gulf of Mexico. Those are fishes that are found nowhere else on the planet as far as we can tell, but just uh, some of those found in the Gulf. So what we know is, or what we think we know, is right now there are about 77 endemic fishes in the Gulf of Mexico that we recognize. Um, out of those 77, there's an awful lot that we know virtually nothing about, almost more than half of them. And one of the things that uh, we started to look at is since the 2010 oil spill, there are 14 currently that have been unreported uh, in natural history collections. So that was the first wave of the research. And now continuing that research, I'm trying to work with shrimpers and fishermen and members of the public that are so uh, involved with um, the Gulf of Mexico that are really like living in the Gulf of Mexico a lot of their lives to help me try to look for some of those missing fish. So one of the ways that I'm, I'm trying to kind of inspire or at least try to start to get to know uh, shrimpers and fishermen and oyster folks uh, here is through art. So it's the research side, the science side, but I'm also using um, lots of different artistic strategies to try to engage um, audiences in public settings. So one of the projects was called Crude Life, which was a whole team project that I was the PI on. And in this case, it dealt with looking for those missing fish from the scientific side, but also creating a portable museum where I was able to commission artists to create this portable natural history museum that traveled around to marinas and festivals and schools and places where uh, fishermen and their families gathered and also oil field workers gathered and just members of the public and it was a really great way to get folks to to look at some of the very inspirational and very unique diversity in the Gulf of Mexico we have and through that it was really a great way to start to talk to people engage with them talk about complicated issues like the 2010 oil spill um, since 2010 a lot of my work has dealt with the BP um, 
Deepwater Horizon spill. It's as Many of you know it was one of the largest oil spills in human history, if not the largest, at least occurring at one moment. Uh, it's been called the worst environmental disaster in U.S. history. Um, so literally the 200 plus million gallons of oil that was spilled into the Gulf had a, had a tremendous impact on uh, ecosystems in the Gulf. And we're still trying to figure out what those long-term ramifications are almost 10 years out. So a lot of my projects uh, have dealt with that both from the art side and the science side. And one of the larger installations was called Collapse. And this was a large pyramid sculptural installation, which involved over 26,000 specimens stacked in these glass jars on glass so that it literally kind of created a, a sculptural representation of the Gulf food chain but only a tiny representation. It was 20, over 26,000 specimens representing less than 400 species, which is a tiny little fragment. You imagine collapse. If you had another like 97 of those, that would be closer to just what we know about the diversity in the Gulf of Mexico. So the underlying goal of that piece, if there is, one was self-expression and working with a team of, sci of other science folks but also a way to speculate what we thought might be happening as a result of this spill, how species might disappear, um, and what impact on the food chain that might have. But also to show people just a little bit about the complexity of huge environments like the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, there's so much diversity and there's so much interconnection between all the different species that we're still learning about. Um, so on one hand, I hope that the piece would be a kind of memorial to the, the organisms that were lost and the, the human lives that were lost um, during this bill, but also a way to kind of inspire people to want to learn more about this amazing, you know, our Amazon rainforest in the United States and how and why this is just such a special part of the world and why we should be concerned for it and want to protect it. Much of my work is dealt with um, wanting to inspire people to protect and conserve biodiversity. And I think one of the, the first stages and one of the ways that art can really work in a very special way is just that, to inspire people by, by giving a visual presence even to an absence of a species can have a powerful impact when, when somebody's viewing a visual work of art. And then in other strategies, by showing people what's missing or what's there but has been altered by our human activity, that I think that's a really key component that art can do. It can really reach us in a way that, that science can't. It can reach us at a very emotive level and a very interpersonal level. And I think that's one of the first stages to try to inspire change in behaviors for us. Um, so a lot of my work over the years has dealt with um, changes to marine ecosystems and the world's oceans. And as we know, um, the oceans are the origin of life on our Earth and the origin of the lineage that brought us here. So they're, they're so rich and there's so many things that we still are yet to know about them. And there's all these rapid changes that are happening. We know that so many of the fisheries are depleted, um, but we also know that conservation works. When people are aware of these issues, when there are actually sustainable seafood choices, most folks will choose those choices instead because I think many, many people, probably most people, um, want to make sure that life uh, continues, that we always have these species for future generations to experience, to find joy in them. So I think um, one of the big keys is just allowing people to become aware of this and figuring out creative strategies maybe that combine art and, co and science to really reach people with a conservation message. So as we're here listening to this documentary, um, all over the world, rapid changes are taking place. Uh, be these loss of biodiversity, be these changes to terrestrial or aquatic ecosystems, alterations that we're making, um, but also the fact that we're sculpting the globe's climate and how that's not only impacting ourselves already, but how that's impacting other species like insects and arthropods and amphibians. And so I think it's 
we're at a really interesting moment in human history where we know that we're causing all of these widespread changes and all these like tremendous environmental uh, issues are facing us now and they're complicated. They're not science problems, they're not art problems, they're human issues. But the good side to that is because we are so remarkably creative and because we are so much more aware of what's happening around us now, I think we really have the ability to start to solve some of these complicated problems. And a lot of that deals with that first level again of just becoming aware of them, becoming inspired and empowered to make changes in our daily lives. Every time we go to the grocery store, we vote. Anytime we're purchasing anything, we're making a, a decision, whether consciously or otherwise, to support certain types of behaviors. How we transport ourselves different places, what we're doing in our backyard or on our rooftop or not doing. All of those actions or inactions can have an impact and they can be really positive. One of the things that I've seen growing all over the world at this point, really, uh, especially here in the United States, is this kind of push towards creating habitats in your own backyard. And really that's about kind of often inaction. It's not just mowing and spraying everything to create this, this kind of uh, golf course in your backyard. It's acknowledging that that outdoor habitat can benefit other species like avians and birds and mammals and, and especially insects. So just things like that, becoming aware that even through a small behavior, you can make a contribution to biodiversity. As we're recording this documentary, the Amazon rainforest is on fire. In Southeast Asia, the forests there are burning. We know that most of the global fisheries are in decline. Some are on the verge of major collapse. There are all these pressing environmental huge issues that are happening right now. Our endangered species just got chopped. Uh, however, we have to stay focused on trying to do what we can. We can and we will save lots of different species and in, ho in turn hopefully save ourselves in the process. Uh, life wants to persist if we let it. It will thrive if we nurture it and just allow space for other species to exist too. And the more that we learn and the more we become inspired to be aware and learn about these different species and try to protect them, the more that we're going to have a positive impact on the future. So I always say, um, no matter how negative things look around us, focus on what you can do every day to try to make something helpful in your backyard or in your community or around the world in a different way. All of those little actions have an impact and they can be incredibly positive. So From a tract of agricultural land in South Louisiana, the Balanchet Famille created the Atelier du La Fête, a nature campus and eco-reserve creating wildlife habitat, planting over 1,000 baby trees, and designed to sequester carbon. It is the world's greatest challenge to reduce the warming of our planet, driven by increased CO2 emissions that can be seen dramatically rising since the Industrial Revolution. But more concerning is you can see the rapid rise in just the last 30 years. You have seen how it is affecting our ocean life, and it is dangerously warming and shrinking our ice sheets in Greenland and Arctic oceans. But there are solutions to sustainability, and they can be found in the actions of turning to renewable energy, countering CO2, hydropower, wind, and solar among them. And each are growing exponentially. I'm John Purvis from Solar Revolution in Erie, Pennsylvania. This is a residential ground mount for a home that we've done. Um, we're doing about two residences a week for the last uh, almost 11 years, now. many people are going solar now is because the payoff is there. You're getting all of your electricity paid for in under 10 years for a system that makes power for 25 years. Even without a federal policy or some state policies, we're seeing it happening more and more just because it's, it's smart business. It's environmentally friendly. It has the financial payoff and it, provides a good product. 
we're going to see more and more county and city and municipal policies rather than huge state and federal policies coming up. I love what I do. I get to change of scenery and talk to people twice a week, my scenery changes. The wonderful thing about why we're successful is not this, but it's the math. Uh, we, we sell a product that everyone feels good doing and it works, the math works, the payoff is there. It's a, it's a win-win all around. And we recycle the cardboard that it comes in. You know, the only thing that I could do probably better is get rid of the gas guzzling work vans that we have and go with green vehicles. But you know, that's coming up in the future. There's no downside to renewables and solar. As we journey through solutions to save our clean air and water, it is critical to understand how our oceans, lakes, and land are compromised by drilling and the urgency for us to turn to renewables as our temperatures are rising and the extreme weather events are growing in ferocity. We live in one hydrosphere. All water sources are connected and our children have been exposed and contaminated to fracking water. Only 1% of, of the water on our planet is drinkable water. An anti-fracking campaign from Pennsylvania where high volume hydraulic fracking has been happening for years. Since fracking came to Pennsylvania, it's had a very divisive effect on communities. These are people who have lived on these properties for generations and they've never had these problems before. And as soon as they started fracking and then their water went bad, then their animals started getting sick, their families started getting sick. You can look at every single state where they've been fracking and you can't find one place where there haven't been significant well failures, where there haven't been spills, leaks, explosions. We are not the industry's guinea pigs. We cannot compromise our water supply or our health, you know, while they figure out what is a very costly, very dangerous, very dirty technology. Doctors in Pennsylvania are banned from revealing to their patients what chemicals they may be poisoned by. That includes radium-228 and uranium from Marcellus shale gas drilling and fracking. Half of fracking water flowback from each drilled well is highly toxic. Our Earth's water is compromised by any fossil fuel drilling as watersheds carry the toxins silently and insidiously to the innocent. A fossil fuel company's bottom line is not the bottom line health interest of our families and a planet damaging its ecosystem. Our collective air, land, and water. But we see a world turning away from fossil fuels to energy efficient transportation. We see New York City, a leadership example with their massive multi-layered people moving grid, building energy efficiency and green urban infrastructure. We have a world looking to transport their people with energy efficient transportation. There is hope. We also have a world looking to our legislators. And we the people, each one of us can become proactive in working with our legislators uh, it was very, very visible down in Miami. Scientists are saying that the 42nd parallel or above is good for climate change for the future. So I've also encouraged my children to think about that when they start setting down roots. Uh, so Juan's a climate refugee before it becomes an issue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's an issue yeah. down in Miami well, already. It is, it is. But it is. The foresight. Yeah. So... Sorry for interrupting you. Yeah. No, so it's just very important to leave the world a better place than we came in. Mm -hmm. and, and renewable energies are here now. 
there's more jobs in renewable energy in the state of Pennsylvania than there are fossil fuel jobs. And our youth want to be part of that conversation. Which is 100% renewable by 2050. Uh, you can let Dan know that there were seven constituents from his home area here in support of seeing this uh, SB 630 get passed. And our legislators are listening as citizens young and old continue to grow in large numbers on capital steps, looking to renewables. Because, as you have witnessed, the cost of climate is sparing no communities in any country. So it is for climate justice for all citizens that we turn to organizations and people who are leaders and best practice climate education. David, if you had something you could say to a community and its planners, what plans would you propose? If I were king, <laughs> um, I would in, encourage municipalities to, to look at the, these regulations that Mel Creek and others have adopted, um, encourage the greening of parking lots for all these benefits that we've already mentioned. Um, I would encourage people to uh, put uh, green rooftops. Uh, there's so many benefits to uh, having a green, a green roof. You know, I, I'm all about green energy. I'd have solar panels and green rooftops everywhere, uh, just like France now requires. Any new commercial building must have either a green rooftop or a uh, series of panels on their rooftops. It's just required. And it will address climate change and so many other benefits, stormwater and heat um, reduction and property value improvements. So green infrastructure is just something that makes common sense. And David, that being said, I wish you were king. <laughs> and we also find leadership in climate justice in the nature of cities. I'm David Maddox from The Nature of Cities. We started The Nature of Cities about seven years ago as a platform for transdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, joined conversations about the idea of how do we make better cities, cities that are better for both people and nature. In that sense, a key word in the nature of cities is the word of. That is, it's not the nature in cities, it's the nature of cities. What is the character of the cities that we want to create? Well, we want to create cities that are resilient, sustainable, livable, and just. Now, we want to do it through a green lens. We want to do it using uh, nature-based solutions, parks, open space, biodiversity, but through the idea of community building, community engagement, and lots of different points of view from the city engaged in the conversation. Because cities are made up of many different points of view, many different needs, many different disciplines and ways of knowing and modes of action. We need to incorporate those different ways of knowing into these conversations if we're going to have cities that are better for everybody. Now, the thing that I want to, for, with respect to climate change, one of the most important things, resilient, sustainable, livable, and just, I want to talk about that idea of justice for a minute, equity. If we truly believe in the benefits of green for people and nature, nature-based solutions, green space, parks, open space, biodiversity. If we truly believe in those issues, the benefits of green, then we must also ask ourselves the question, who deserves to enjoy those benefits? Well, the, an the answer is everybody, no? Does everyone enjoy those benefits now? No, they don't. And so that's one of the key things that I think we all need to be engaged about, the connecting the idea of environmentalism, green spaces, green solutions for cities and the world to questions of justice because everybody needs to, to uh, experience and enjoy the benefits that we're creating, that we believe in, 
for better cities, cities that are better for both people and nature, and better for everybody, so that certain communities don't get the benefits of resilience, of the, the happiness benefits of green spaces, the, the uh, stormwater retention benefits of street trees. Everybody needs to enjoy those. We know that those benefits are critical for the idea of both, of both adapting to climate change, but also trying to reduce the, the, the intensity of climate change. Street trees, parks that are good for both resilience to climate change, but also good for the happiness of people right now. So in the work of The Nature of Cities, we are a platform that, that explicitly tries to engage multiple voices, different ways of knowing, different modes of action. So we are an organization that gathers the stories, the work of architects and scientists and social scientists and community workers and activists and artists, policymakers from all over the world because we believe that joining these conversations across ways of knowing creates something that we could not have created by ourselves. So it's not just the ecologists over in one corner talking amongst themselves and the architects over there talking among themselves and the people who manage the city and create the, the master plans talking with nobody. The idea at The Nature of Cities is to have joined conversations across different points of view so we can actually negotiate those points of view in ways that, that reveal the idea of, uh, of the things about the things we believe in, the things that we believe are important, and negotiate the different needs that we might have, and, and, and actually bridge the idea of, of mixing value conversations so we can all get something that we need in this, in this regard. So in Nature Cities, it's those different practitioners from around the world talking about their work to each other. And so we might learn from each other in that way. That was the idea behind doing a, a physical version of the Nature of Cities virtual platform online at thenatureofcities.com in Paris for our first Paris summit, where we had almost 400 people from around the world, all those different points of view, in workshop conversations about how do we build cities that are better for both people and nature. Cities that are resilient, sustainable, livable, and just. With the core idea, the core motivation is how can we collaborate to make better cities? As we conclude this documentary, we will be meeting NOAA's Climate Education Coordinator, Frank Neopold. Frank representing NOAA, was one of the 45,000 participants voting at the Paris Climate Accord. Frank's words speak hope to a world affected by climate change and hope to its collaborative efforts working together. My name is Frank Niepold. I'm the Climate Education Coordinator at NOAA in the Climate Program Office. Um, and I'm also coordinating climate education across federal agencies like the National Science Foundation, EPA, Department of Energy. In addition to that, I also represent the U.S. government in education, training, and public access uh, in reporting that to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the treaty that led to the IPCC, also to the Paris Agreement. One of the pieces of the work that I do is to move this, this climate education and move the partners forward. Uh, back in 2013, a group of us put forth initiatives to highlight and, and, and extend that partnership and development and, uh, at Paris, at the Paris Agreement. In addition to that, also I was, the, the, as part of the delegation, the civil servant, the youth and education delegate for the United States government of Paris in, in, uh, in COP21. So what you got to see there were the young leaders, people that, that weren't the young activists on the stage, but thousands of young students who had chosen independent of all of us to focus on becoming the next financier manager for this or the uh, you know communications for that or an economist or a social scientist trying to help communities in rural communities deal with sea level rise and you would just get to meet them on the trains and on the buses and, and uh, all over where we were convening and you got to see the results of what education can do 
But the most important thing there I found was that the youth were pushing education to serve what they saw as a critical need going forward, as opposed to what we were calling for. So we're really responding to their requests and expertise to invest in them so that they can continue to carry on the work that we were committing to in Paris. So as we were talking before about Paris and the Paris Agreement, one of the reasons why it is such a critically important meeting and conference and agreement was that before Paris, 20 years of the Conference of Parties and the UN Treaty process really couldn't come up with an agreement. And then we came up with a new way that countries could work together on this issue. It says every form of humanity, whatever grouping you want to use, could agree to the same goal. So when you were there, there were 45,000 people all working collaboratively uh, together across those two weeks. But you felt hope. The task before us actually isn't really about nations anymore. What it is, it feels like, and it looks like, and in reality is that cities, communities, towns, states, subnational entities, if you will, that's more of the technical jargon, are really taking on the heavy work of transforming their economies and communities, both to deal with the carbon emissions side, but also to deal with the increased need for resilience to the impacts that have already started to grow and affect communities across the country and across the world. For over 200 years, our country's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, is the agency of the United States federal government that is responsible for monitoring our climate and our environment and taking the proactive steps to protect a planet. It is also the agency that is in the alignment with the Paris Climate Accord to globally reduce fossil fuel emissions that are the driver of climate change. NOAA is the hierarchy in climate education. It's also the hope for a nation in collaboration with a world, and it serves to be our hope for the future. From countries, to cities, to townships, to boroughs, to individual citizens that are thinking and acting globally, they are the network connecting best practices to a world. It is that hierarchy of that connection action that will lead to our children's future. Our children are aware this planet, this earth that we call home is our collective address. As we conclude this documentary, our nation has been withdrawn from the Paris Climate Agreement, but the people of the world, from every country, every state, every city, understand that the only viable future is with renewable energy and a green world. It is we, the people, all of us, who are the Green Connection. It's all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. 
Yet, you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet, I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. For more than 30 years, the science has been crystal clear. How dare you continue to look away and come here saying that you are doing enough when the politics and solutions needed are still nowhere in sight. You say you hear us and that you understand the urgency. But no matter how sad and angry I am, I do not want to believe that. Because if you really understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil and that I refuse to believe. Cutting our emissions in half in 10 years only gives us a 50% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees and the risk of setting off irreversible chain reactions beyond human control. 50% may be acceptable to you, but those numbers do not include tipping points, most feedback loops, additional warming hidden by toxic air pollution or the aspects of equity and climate justice. They also rely on my generation sucking hundreds of billions of tons of your CO2 out of the air with technologies that barely exist. So a 50% risk is simply not acceptable to us, we who have to live with the consequences. To have a 67% chance of staying below a 1.5 degrees of global temperature rise, the best odds given by the IPCC, the world had 420 gigatons of CO2 left to emit back on January 1st, 2018. Today that figure is already down to less than 350 gigatons. How dare you pretend that this can be sold with just business as usual and some technical solutions? With today's emissions levels, that remaining CO2 budget will be entirely gone within less than eight and a half years. There will not be any solutions or plans presented in line with these figures here today because these numbers are too uncomfortable and you are still not mature enough to tell it like it is. You are failing us. But the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. The world is waking up. And change is coming whether you like it or not.